Hello, Curran here. This video is all about envisioning interaction in data visualization. Let's say you have a data set and you want to make some really cool interactive data visualization from it, but you don't know where to start. The idea of this video is to give you some ideas and inspiration for going about this process of doing a data visualization project where the end result will be a really cool interactive data visualization. Now I'm going to frame some of this in the context of this awesome book, Visualization Analysis and Design, and I'm going to take certain figures from this book and use them sort of as guiding principles. I'm also going to go over a number of examples of interactive data visualizations and then relate them back to concepts discussed in the book. The first thing you need to do is identify the columns of your data set, the attributes of your data set. What type are they? Are they categorical? Are they ordered? Or are they quantitative? You also need to have some sort of guiding tasks or questions. What do you want to do from this data? You know, if someone looks at your interactive data visualization, what should they be able to achieve? These sort of tasks and questions should come right up front before you even start designing the visualization. You need to have a goal in mind. Then you can start understanding what's possible in terms of visually encoding your attributes based on these marks and channels from chapter two of this book. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. This video is more about the interaction parts. In the later parts of the book, there are certain figures that really capture the essence of interactions that you could add to data visualizations. This is one of those figures. Here's another one of those figures. And here's another one. But rather than try to explain all of these individually, which, and, and these are all general things, I want to start with examples, you know, particular specific examples of interactive visualizations and then put them into the context of these figures. Here's an interactive visualization that is a choropleth map on the top and a line chart with multiple lines on the bottom that shows population data from the United Nations going back to 1950. One interaction here is that you can hover over each of these places and this information will pop up. This is often called a tooltip. And I think in terms of interaction, Tooltips could be considered a form of select or selecting something by hovering. You're selecting that thing. You can also hover here to select which year is shown in the map. See, a map can only really show data for a single point in time. So if I say move my mouse to 1990, now the data values that are showing on the map are representative of that year 1990. This sort of interaction is an example of filtering because when you select a year the data is filtered to only include the points that have that year and then that filtered data is shown on the map. You can also click and drag to pan and then use the scroll wheel to zoom on this map. And again zooming here is a form of filtering where as you zoom in, that filters the lines that are shown in the line chart. Panning and zooming falls under manipulate. These are sort of navigational item reduction techniques, so to speak. You can also hover over a shape to see its corresponding line in the line chart. So if you hover over, say, Rwanda here, you can see that there's a big dip in the population of Rwanda around 1994. This kind of interaction is called linked highlighting. Here's a scatter plot with menus. So you can use these menus to change what's shown as X, Y, and color. This sort of animation in response to changing the columns could be considered as change over time. This scatterplot also has tooltips. 
This moon calendar has an interaction where you can click on it to see what today is. I think that would also be a form of select. Here's a linked scatter plot and bar chart where you can brush in the scatter plot to select the set of points that gets filtered by and then that set of points gets aggregated into the data that's shown in the bar chart. This uses brushing which is often used with linked highlighting but I don't think this is really linked highlighting. This actually uses the brush to drive filtering of items and then that filtered data gets aggregated by attributes and that resulting aggregated data is what's shown in the bar chart. Here's a hierarchical tree visualization that has panning and zooming. This sort of zooming is geometric zooming because everything is just purely enlarged. Here's a stacked bar chart that has tooltips. This also has an interaction where you can hover over the different color legend items and see what happens. These values get highlighted in the visualization. And I think this is something you could pretty much always add if you're using color to encode some data. I think this could be considered a form of linked highlighting where one of the views that's linked is the color legend. Here is a visualization of migrant deaths in the Mediterranean and you can use the brushing on the date histogram on the bottom in order to filter the input that's shown on the map. This interaction lets you really clearly see temporal trends that are occurring. This is sort of like linked highlighting, but I'm not sure if it is because we're actually filtering out the values outside the range. We're using the brush to drive a filter where only certain items are included on the map. This also has panning and zooming and as you zoom in, the zoomed window on the map feeds into a filter of the data that's aggregated by month, I think, and then shown on the bottom in the date histogram. This is an instance where panning and zooming is actually used to drive a filter of items. Then the resulted filtered data is aggregated by month and shown in the date histogram. Notice that when you zoom in and out here, the size of the circles remains constant on the screen. This is a form of semantic zooming, where things are not just purely enlarged. The points get reprojected and then they're drawn the same size on the screen as they were before. Here's a stacked area chart of causes of death and you can drill down by clicking through the hierarchy. So here's just the forms of cancer and if you click on lymphoma, leukemia, and myeloma you get these more detailed variations. See we can use this tree hierarchy widget thing to navigate through the tree and then what we're seeing at that particular level of the hierarchy is used to filter the input to the stacked area chart. This is a case of linked views with filtering in action. Here is sort of a schematic example of focus plus context zooming using brushing. I think this could be considered a kind of semantic zooming. Also, the focus view is only showing a subset of the data from the context view. The same pattern of focus plus context can also be applied to scatter plots. Crossfilter is an amazing library for fast, multi-dimensional filtering. In the example on their home page, you can select multiple brushes in different um, dimensions here and then drag them around and as you drag the brushed region 
causes all of the data to be filtered and then it's aggregated separately for each individual view. This is filtering and aggregation in action at the same time. Here's a World City Explorer with panning and zooming and also tooltips. The tooltips are a form of select and this is geometric zooming because everything is just purely enlarged. Here's a project I worked on to do with campaign finance law. This also has tooltips. This has an interaction where you can hover over the items in the color legend and that will cause the data to be filtered by these bins and then the uh, items that fall into these bins are highlighted as you hover over them. This is linked highlighting. The map shows the data for the year that's currently selected. This is filtering of items. You can also change the sorting of the grid and you can change which columns are shown. Here's a stacked area chart of Syrian refugees by settlement type. You can hover over a point in time to get more information about that particular point in time. This is a variation of the tooltip concept. Here's a visualization by the United Nations Refugee Agency where you can hover over a bar on this bar chart here to filter the year that's shown on the map. If you hover over this other stacked bar chart here, other data is shown on the map, showing you the differences. This also has tooltips, and you can click on an individual country to filter the data shown in the bar charts to just show the data for that selected country. There's a lot going on here with linked filtering. Here's a project I'm working on with two stream graphs for origin and destination. Clicking on one of these streams filters the data by that particular origin and it shows where people go to from that origin over time in the other stream graph on the bottom. This is an example of filtering and aggregation happening together. The data is filtered based on what you click on and then it's aggregated by year before it's presented as a stream graph. Here's a further evolution of that project where selecting a certain year filters the data by that year and then that filtered data is shown on the bar chart to the right. This is another instance of filtering. And I gotta say this is one of my all-time favorite interactive data visualizations. This is earth.nullschool.net by, I think his name is Cameron Beccario. This is really amazing. It shows you the current real-time weather conditions. And it's got panning and zooming, but it's panning and zooming on a globe <laughs> that rotates. I just think that's so cool. And you can zoom in. This is showing wind right now but you can actually change what is showing. For example, you could change the overlay to show temperature instead of wind. Now you get these other colors that show temperature. So those were some interactive visualizations that I think are good examples of interactive data visualization and I hope they illustrate some of the things that are possible when you start to add interaction into data visualizations. And I hope these can serve as inspiration for you to design and build your own interactive data visualization project.